conversation starters. I'm sure many of you have more questions and they'll all be here to answer them afterwards. But so for both Beth and Holly, I would like to know what was the origin story for the natural history of horror and then for Holly, monsters as a genre at Universal Pictures. Oh, well, as Lori indicated in her opening remarks, the Natural History Museum is somewhat unusual in that we house both uh, scientific collections and historic and cultural collections here. And we're always looking for programs and projects that will merge the two. And so several years ago, I had developed an exhibition proposal, Children of the Night, uh, that was going to be about the scientific and literary origins of horror films. And so when Lori made it clear earlier this year that she thought it would be a wonderful idea to welcome the Academy Museum into the LA fold of museums, uh, this proposal was brought up again, resurrected, and we evolved it into the exhibition you're going to see shortly, Natural History of Horror. And the monster genre at Universal Pictures, tell us more about well, that. Um, I think we can thank Carl Lindley Jr. Um, who was given the job on his 21st birthday as president of production, and he brought forth these literary properties and coupled them with German Expressionism and and he started with um, in 1931 Dracula yes. and then followed that with Frankenstein in 1930 no that was February in 1931 and then in November Dracula came um, I mean, Frankenstein came, and then it was The Mummy in 1933, and then um, Invisible Man in 33 as well, and then Bride of Frankenstein in 1935. So without him, and he, I think he had a lot of resistance, people thought that he was um, um, being too uh, outrageous to kind of bring these pieces to life, but he did, and it's been part of our DNA ever since. And we followed that up, and we have about 75 films in our library of the genre, and that everybody has appreciated for all this time. Wonderful. Um, Beth and Jeff, can you tell us more about the NHM Moving Collection and Universal Archives and the unique relationship between the two? Uh, we began the history department collecting motion picture artifacts in 1930. And because we began so early and before it was considered a real industry and worthy of collecting, uh, we were the first through the door. And so all of the major studios and many of their founders, the inventors, the animators, etc., donated to us. So our collection has impeccable provenance. And a lot of that is due to Universal because not only did Universal as a studio donate to us, but also the founding family, the Lemley family members through the years have donated to us. So we've often worked with Jeff and the Universal Archives, kind of both blending our collections, but also they've been very generous opening their doors so that we can research what we have. And my department at Universal is the Archives and Collections Department. So we collect, preserve, maintain all of the other historic movie memorabilia, props, costumes, artwork, posters, photography, that document the history of our studio. And so um, there have been a lot of opportunities where Beth has collections that she wanted to authenticate the provenance on it, and we have the photographs from those. So she'll come over and can verify what productions those were from. And some, some of them are somewhat obscure silent films, you know. But it's been a real joy to really marry these collections together to um, really document the history of the movie industry and Los Angeles. So it's been a real honor working with the Natural History Museum and Beth. And then Beth and I also serve on the board of Hollywood Heritage together. So um, yeah, we've got a great symbiotic relationship. <laughs> I like that science word. Um, <laughs> so can each of you share maybe an unexpected story of discovery through this exhibition process? Uh, you're going to get a geek answer to this question. I love it. <laughs> uh, no, uh, when Universal donated a large pool, about 50 uh, props to us in 1935, they were from films across the board. 
films you never heard of again. And then these horror props just happened to be among those. And out of the 50, only about a dozen were identified as to which films they came from. And there were two, a broom and a pitchfork, that were among the dozen that had been identified. And they were supposed to be from a film called The Good Fairy. But years ago, I watched The Good Fairy. Nothing like them appears in it. So when we were working and doing the research on the horror exhibit, a couple of months ago, I took the opportunity to think, hmm, wouldn't it be lovely if the pitchfork and broom showed up in one of the horror films? Lo and behold, they did, and I was able to go over to the archives and verify it with stills in their key books. So we actually have a prop uh, pitchfork and broom from The Bride of Frankenstein, but unfortunately, the discovery came too late to be able to, <laughs> fabrication for the cases yeah, next time. underway. <laughs> yes. But if you come to our Frankenstein program, we're hoping to bring them out there and you'll be able to see them, a uh, special viewing. Great, and as for me, surprises that we came, um, came across working on this exhibit. So, um, you know, Holly had mentioned Carl Lindley Jr. and his work and the classic monsters that really um, originated with him. It was this perfect timing of marriage between the German immigrants who were working in the film industry and bringing over German expressionism. It was the advent of sound as well. But then you can also go back a little bit further than that. Um, you know, if you want to go way back to the studio with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1913 um, to The Hunchback of Notre Dame, 1923, to The Phantom of the Opera, 1925. There was a tradition of this at Universal that really came to life when Carl Lindley Jr. got involved, when German Expressionism got involved, when the advent of sound came along. So I think it just gave me a richer appreciation for the classic monsters and how they evolved at Universal over the years from the very beginning of the studio. The studio was formed in, in 1912 as the origins of Universal and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was 1913. So um, like Holly said, you can really see it woven throughout the DNA of the studio from the very beginning. Great. Um, so these films have male scientists and monsters as the protagonists. So can you tell us about how the women such as Millicent Patrick and Mary Shelley contributed to the genre then, and what are the role of women in this genre now? That's all of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll speak about Millicent Patrick, and uh, obviously she's at the forefront now thanks to that wonderful book, The Lady from the Black Lagoon, that came out earlier this year. Uh, and when I read the book, I was just amazed that she had worked on, uh, well, she'd been raised at San Simeon. Hearst was a donor to us. We have Hearst collections here at the Natural History Museum. Uh, she worked at Disney. We have Disney's animation stand here and some uh, pieces from Fantasia, a film that she worked on. And even uh, during her acting career, uh, she was a bit player in a number of films, including one called The Prodigal. And I've watched it many times because we have costumes from that film. And I then realized that that woman in the background in those scenes, lo and behold, is Millicent Patrick. And so even above and beyond her designing the creature costume for the creature from the Black Lagoon, she's woven throughout our collection here at the Natural History Museum. And so that to me uh, was a surprise, uh, but also it made me realize what a difficult industry it would be for a woman to work in and how she had to constantly reinvent herself. She changed her name with each almost reinvention and how she maintained uh, being in the industry, everything from an animator to a bit player. Um, you know, I can, I can just speak a, a little bit about the, the women in science. When, we, when I first got to Universal, I was doing some research on Bride of Frankenstein and thinking of like, okay, how can we um, imagine genetic modification today? And as I looked into it more, I realized that the, the technology and the science behind CRISPR, which is the genetic modification of DNA, was um, patented by two women. One, uh, a scientist, Jennifer Dinda, out of um, uh, Berkeley, and her partner, Manuela, in um, Paris. And 
it was shocking because I kind of always thought that science was a, a field for uh, with a lot of men, but then I, after I uncovered so much, I realized that it is a field where women have a big presence. Um, if you look at Hidden Figures a couple of years ago, we illuminated a women's role in that. And, and at our studio, we are, um, we're led by a woman, uh, uh, an incredibly talented uh, woman who is the chairman of our film group, Donna Langley, and she has such insight and intuition on what we want in the film industry and is, is such a great leader for all of us. And as the Universal Archivist, I have to go back again to the early days of Universal. <laughs> so um, one of the most prolific directors of all time in the silent era was Lois Weber, who was a contract player, director, producer at Universal in the early, early days. And she was also elected mayor of Universal City back in 1914. Um, Universal City also had a female police chief named Laura Oakley, whose police uniform is also in the collection of the Natural History Museum. So Universal, was a innovator in giving women the opportunity to take these leadership roles within the motion picture industry. And that's also something else that's been woven through our DNA throughout the years. So I think when, you know, these properties like Frankenstein, which was written by Mary Shelley, and when Millicent Patrick had the opportunity to work on Creature from the Black Lagoon, that women's roles at the studio had some had been something that had been around since the very beginning as well so um yeah i'm really proud of that legacy that universal has last question because i know everyone's really excited to get into the gallery is can you tell us about the future with monsters and collections at nhm beth and universal pictures holly well obviously we're hoping that the public will have a wonderful experience viewing this exhibit and I think a lot of where our research goes next and where our programming goes is I think a lot going to depend on how the public feels and how they respond and certainly I'll continue collaborating with Jeff on projects both in Los Angeles and abroad over the next years well um, we're just going to make amazing movies That's what's <laughs> happening. All right. And, um, you know, we're really um, following a directive of filmmakers coming forward that have um, passion for these characters and, and have a real vision to reimagine them for the core fans and also a new audience. So lots of really, really great movies coming your way. Invisible Man is coming yes. out yes. In, in March, and so I think everybody will really um, love that. It is uh, has it pays homage to the classic themes of the Invisible Man, but also has a contemporary vibe that I feel like people will really connect to. Very exciting. And something that I really love about the monsters is that they're continually reinterpreted over and over again. And it's so fun to see these different incarnations of the monsters throughout the history of Universal and with these properties like, you know, all the Frankenstein films that have been made. And, and it's great to see artists continuing to reinterpret them. And that's still on the horizon is that these characters, these stories are gonna be continued to be reinterpreted and seen in different lights for, for the Near forever. future and forever, yeah. Forever. Right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Yeah.